It's uh, March the 23rd, 2018. We're here at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. to interview Michael Tabor as part of the Lessons of the 60s project of IPS that focuses on the experiences of activists in the Washington, D.C. area from 1960 to 1975. Uh, I'm John Hanrahan, and I and Ann Gallivan will be interviewing Michael. Uh, Eddie Becker will be filming the interview. Uh, we should note that our project conducted a previous interview with Michael, which focused solely on his Jewish activism, so we might not touch as much on that today as, as should, be the, should be expected. So for almost 60 years, Michael has been in the forefront of the major social justice issues of our time as an organizer and participant. In the period covered by our Lessons of the 60s project, Michael was involved in the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-Vietnam War Movement, the Farm Workers Union, Great Boycott, the uh, creation of the first Jewish New Left political group in the country, and on and on, as we'll hear in this interview. In the process, uh, this is my own personal comment, Michael has inspired, persuaded, prodded, cajoled scores of people to join him in one social justice effort or another. Guilt tripped. What's that? Guilt -tripped. Guilt tripped. All right, I was leaving that one out. Uh, he, uh, he has a unique talent for chatting up people, and the next thing they know, they're out in the picket line with him or going door to door for a candidate or an issue or staying up late to prepare testimony for a public hearing. So with that, we'll uh, talk to the amazing Michael Tabor and uh, turn to our questions. As, and Michael, just tell us uh, where you grew up, uh, who your parents were, what your early inspirations for um, social activism were, and then on to college and then You know, I'd like to say Norman Thomas, because when we moved uh, right near Forest Hills High School in, in uh, Queens, New York, right. um, I, I remember nothing else stands out except hearing and watching and being in the auditorium in 1959. And you were how old? Was it? How old well, was it? one year 17. before college, yeah, I was 17, 17 yeah. something like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, but my parents were kind of somewhat typical at first, um, Democrats, social Democrats at best. But never knew until I got much older that my mother's father, my grandfather wrote for the for the for uh for arbitishtima the voice of the free worker a yiddish anarchist publication and um and that uh, uh we had a relative who fought in the spanish civil war but again these things were kind of hidden for me mm -hmm. because we had just gone through the 50s and the mccarthy era you know, mm -hmm. early memory was 1952 or 53 watching the Army McCarthy uh, hearings. I remember what, not knowing what was going on, but I also remember the fear and, of the era and, and relative uh, discomfort. And I, I remember a warning from my parents when I was in, uh, I guess, elementary school. Don't tell anyone we're Democrats. Democrats. So, Not even um, socialists, sir. <laughs> no. So I grew up in that time of fear. I was born in 1942. And I had always lived until we moved a block away from Forest High School in low income public housing. And that was in? Uh, that was uh, from the time after I was born uh, in Brooklyn, New York, in uh, Fort Greene, mm -hmm. which still stands near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mm -hmm and uh, led somewhat of a sheltered upbringing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I spoke with a strong Brooklyn accent. Uh, outside of uh, some working class Jews, including some survivors of the Holocaust, and people of color, and uh, uh, I, and Puerto Ricans, of course, in the mid-50s, mm -hmm. who started coming up. Uh, I had, I think, uh, until I went to an upstate New York free SUNY college, uh, never came in contact knowingly with a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I saw these blonde-haired, blue-eyed women and I said, Where, what race are they? <laughs> and uh, so, um, so I grew up in Fort Greene and uh, then junior high school, we moved to another, I think, moderate to low-income housing project, uh, 
Pominac across the street from Queens College. Okay. Uh, went to um, junior high school and near there where I met Paul Simon. And, uh, and that's knew the each other. Paul Simon. Yeah, yeah, the Paul Simon, here. not the politician. <laughs> and uh, we, we had a passing acquaintance. We both listened to Gene Shepard. Uh, oh, so that oh. was our, our, our raconteur, rec, rec yes. storyteller. Yes. And uh, we shared that. And then I went to Jamaica High School, which was on triple, quadruple qua session. And so uh, we had to get there at uh, 6.30 in the morning, and we were out by 1 or something wow. like that. And then my parents, realizing I wasn't getting a very good education, not doing well, moved to a garden apartment development near Forest Hills High School. And that's how you lived there. And that's how, yeah. Were you politically active at all in high school, or did that come about when you got to uh, You know, because Sydney? of the working class background, I really felt, and to this day, I'm uncomfortable around wealth. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't do well with wealthy people, and mm -hmm. people coming from, uh, and I'd include intellectuals in that to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I've never been entirely comfortable that much outside of a working class kind of background, uh, and, uh, and I still harbor that somewhat. Uh, and uh, I realize when we go to things, I gravitate toward the waiters <laughs> and uh, you know, the kitchen help that I might know from mm -hmm. a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, the people coming from the wealthy areas, we, I'm not that good in small talk with them. Mm -hmm. When you went to SUNY and, and Oneonta, New York, and uh, I guess you got politically active there, though. People, I think people forget that besides the civil rights movement burgeoning in the early 60s, there was very active uh, anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear weapons, uh, and, and also a, a project to uh, abolish uh, the House on American Activities Committee. And as I understand, you were involved in that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we were, I mean, again, we were from New York. We were automatically from the left. And incredibly radical things like atheism were unheard of mm -hmm. there. And a, a neighboring college, I'm not sure, it might have been Oberlin, not neighboring, but yeah. uh, not that far away, uh, was putting out underground newspapers. And we said, oh, we should put out an underground newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had stories on, on what was going on in the rest of the country and left them, when we mimeographed them up, left them in the old main building for people to see this outrageous, radical stuff for, for the era, for the period. I mean, it was hardly outrageous. But we did. We, we got Pete Seeger, which was a result of just calling him up in mm -hmm. 1961 to uh, come over and sing. Uh, we, we sponsored a film was called... Was that for a specific... Uh, yeah, we were raising money for uh, a person who was from the nearby liberal arts college, uh, Hartwick. And uh, he had been fired because it was found that he had a communist background. And I think we were raising money for his legal defense. Mm -hmm. So uh, we... And finally, uh, after the first year, the... Uh, uh, Dr. Netzer called me and a friend into his office, and he said, "He's the dean, uh, uh, or the president." president he said, yeah. "He said, Michael and Jeffrey, do you like being here?" And, and I, we said, "Well, kind of." Uh, and he said, "Well, if you want to stay here, you either stop all the stuff you're doing, or leave, or I'm going to make you leave, or graduate as fast as you possibly can." So, so we did. We, I, I went through in uh, three years and couldn't wait to get out. I mean, I, we stayed active uh, and uh, kept on doing programs, but we were a little bit more cautious after that. This was a free college. It didn't mm -hmm. cost anything. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, uh, but racism was a thing not within our realm. You know, you saw the pictures and Birmingham of dogs, you know, chasing black people, and you know there might have been a few, a few people of color in 1963, yeah. but very few. Mm -hmm. So you uh, finished there in three years. Then you 
came to the University of Maryland? Yeah, right? my, I wanted to get a, my dream was to get a PhD and teach social anthropology, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so came down here despite my parents' warnings. Came here the weekend of the March on Washington in 1963. So that's... Your parents' warnings that... That I shouldn't should get caught there. up in demonstrations. Oh, oh, they were helping me pay for college. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that I should stay away from. Mm -hmm. So the first weekend I, uh, was the March on Washington. It was that Sunday, mm -hmm. whatever the date was. Mm -hmm. And all I could see were these incredibly respectable people dressed in... I mean, I wasn't... I didn't have a suit. Mm -hmm. Well, I might have one suit, but uh, uh, everyone was nicely dressed, and it was a very respectful, and it, it was an incredible, uh, incredibly well-organized march. First march I'd ever been to. Mm -hmm. And so the next day was Sunday, and that, the next day was Monday, and first class I was sitting, and there was a guy from New York City who happened to be uh, Afro-American, and we're sitting and talking, trying to figure out what was going on. And I said, let's go out for a beer after class and talk about what we're seeing. This is in College Park. Yeah, this is in College Park, yeah. Maryland. And he said, okay. No, I didn't drink beer, but it was okay. So we went to Gennaro's, that was the name of the pizza place and bar, on Route 1. And we sat down, and the waitress came, and she said, I can serve you, but I can't serve him. And stupidly, I said, why? And they said, well... I'm sorry, we just don't serve colored people here. And I said, where have I landed? <laughs> and, yeah. and then, of course, Adelphi, which is where we were living, was a uh, sundown town, if you mm -hmm. were a person of color. And it was getting dark. The police picked you up and took you back mm -hmm. to the district line. I didn't, I mean, this was all a shock. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I could, I heard about the core chapter meeting got involved in the Congress of Racial Equality, mm -hmm. and that, that derailed me for, mm -hmm. for life. Mm -hmm. I, I, AAUP would not take a stand against segregation, later the war in Vietnam, and I said, I, I'm just, just not something I should be going into. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so I realized I had to change directions. Um, you would, then you became actually a chair or president or whatever was the, of the suburban... Well, after, you know. after uh, a year and a half, two years, okay. we had a joint. CORE was not allowed to speak on campus. Uh, CORE was not allowed to meet. Martin Luther King was not allowed to speak on campus. Mm -hmm. So even though they've rewritten that, they say, it's oh, we were really liberal yeah. in the yeah. 60s. It's just bullshit. They were never liberal. But in Maryland, they also had that uh, Ober Law, which said that you had to, if you even spoke on campus, you had to sign it that you were not That's a communist right. and you would, would not right. advocate for the overthrow of the government by That's right. force or violence. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was just something that, and I remember when George Wallace spoke, uh, on campus? Yeah, on campus. At, at, uh, it was, the place was filled, and uh, I forget whether or not he was running, a, he was running against... Uh, well, if it's 64, it would have been, of course, LBJ that he would... No, no, I'm talking about, he was running, I think he was running for senator. He was running against a man whose motto was, your home is your palace. Home is your castle. Your home is your castle. You said George Wallace. Uh, and and George, Wallace came, I'm pretty sure, and ran against him. Oh, to camp campaign. Right. For, for this was, no, the George P. Mahoney was the that's right. your home is your castle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that was 66. He that was, was 66. Against, uh, and, and he was I, running against uh, Agnew. Oh, Spiro Agnew. So that's right. Yeah. So I voted for Spiro Agnew. Yeah. Only time. Weird. Uh, but, <laughs> but I know that George Wallace was there. And he I may thought have come, he, he may was, have campaigned from Mahoney. I thought he was running, but someone else will have to um, straight. So I just got I just got caught up in uh, in civil rights and then the war in Vietnam. You were um, continuing to go to the University of Maryland, or did you? That was during this period. Well, I I knew I was not going to get a degree, yeah, and so. I, I yes I I did go, uh, but I remember in Kofo summer. I was taking a course with John Hope Franklin, and I, uh, uh, historian. yeah, famous historian, uh, one of the few uh, historians of color, and I, uh, 
And I thought he would be sympathetic to me going off for three weeks to North Carolina to do voter registration. Mm -hmm. and, but he was totally unsympathetic, and I think he gave me a D. And I was involved in uh, a, lot of the a lot of stuff. I mean, he was a courageous person. I knew very little about him. But he refused to uh, forgive my lack of attending class, and, and I got credit for it, C minus or a D. But, mm -hmm. but my heart wasn't in uh, studies, even though I stayed there. In, in another year and a half, two years. 1964, for you as well as for what was going on around the country, was a very busy year because you were at the CN, your resume, is you also started the uh, SDS uh, chapter. Well, it was three of us who started SDS. Uh -huh. And we, um, we did a, uh, I mean, here's our mimeographed core. <laughs> Uh, uh, literature, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we went to uh, Cedar Heights, Maryland, uh, just uh, uh, right, very close to um, Fairmont Heights, right on the district line in Prince George's County, off Kenilworth Avenue. And at that point, those streets were unpaved. Uh, I don't believe there was sewerage there. And we did start a Freedom House, a school, um, and um, and we went, we, we got two buses to go to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's challenge in Atlantic City to the Democratic Party. And um, we did a lot of very, oh, we did something that's timely. Uh, SCLC approached us because what separated Cedar Heights from, I think it was Seat Pleasant, was a bob wire fence. So literally you had this really, uh, dilapidated town that may as well look like it was a hundred years before in terms of the shacks uh, that were there. And there was a barbed wire fence topped with barbed wire. I think it was eight feet topped with barbed wire. And in order to go to the closest shopping center, you had to walk, I mean, mile, mile and a half. And SCLC approached us and asked us, if, mentioning that Martin Luther King Wanted to uh, uh, want, wanted to lead a massive demonstration, and uh, and tear down the fence, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so we put it to the community. We had these m weekly meetings, and the community and people who lived there was subject to all their life. Racism, discrimination. I mean, I, I, I must sound pretty good here uh, trying to uh, organize and everything, but it's nothing compared to the a daily life of people living under racism. I, don't, I could always revert back to what we were calling white skin privilege, but, but uh, their concern was what would happen if the fence was torn down. Martin Luther King and the SCLC would leave Mm -hmm. And they'd be, there'd be this outrage from their neighbors on the other side of the fence. They didn't want to be faced with that. So we said no to Martin Luther King and the SCLC. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, in, this uh, you also had, uh, were working at this time for support of fair housing laws in Maryland. We'll get to some other. Yeah, it came a little later with that. access, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, this was talking about. Uh, at the General Assembly, Maryland General Assembly, uh, talked about you being arrested, uh, see, in, in Well, it's kind of skips, yes, yeah, a little bit yeah. later. Yeah. It had yeah. to do with a sit-in uh, for uh, fair, fair housing in the Maryland General Assembly, and I forget if that's 64 okay. or 65, yeah. Harry Mitchell, uh, who had run, run, run for Congress, actually, later, yeah. but he was the head of the... Uh, State Committee on Human Rights, and he tried to intervene on some of the things we were doing mm -hmm. because Prince George's County was a powder keg, yeah. and it would be, there were these little black communities and a majority white community and a segregated, de facto segregated school system yeah. that, uh, that this group challenged. And I, I came across the, uh, one of the references to uh, um, uh, if uh, if P 
people of color came into the schools, they would be a holocaust in the school system, mm -hmm. referring to massive racist mm -hmm. uh, outbreak. At, at the time, Prince George's was still predominantly white, probably 70, 80 percent. I, I don't know if it was that high, but it was a white county. Yeah. And uh, as more and more people from the district, mm -hmm. and maybe even from the south still, I'm not sure, moved into it, white people, you know, community like Hill, communities like Upper Marlboro, Hillcrest mm -hmm. Heights, mm -hmm. uh, moved out mm -hmm. and moved to places where uh, they wouldn't have to deal with integrated schools, mm -hmm. including Montgomery County. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, subsequently Prince George's was under federal court order to integrate. That was, yeah, we that was years later, wasn't it? Well, no, it's not. Yeah. Uh, we actually brought that, that core chapter brought the suit uh, against um, uh, against Prince George's County, and they threatened to cut off all federal funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were asked if we would uh, um, if we withdraw our complaint. Um, so uh, so we refused to do it, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and. They did not want to integrate the schools, mm -hmm. and they were forced to, or lose all federal funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was done by uh, this joint core SDS ERAP project, mm -hmm. Educational Research and Action Project, okay. which is what we designed to mm -hmm. change the nature of Prince George's County and eliminate segregation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not... It, uh, when they had the option, I remember when Hillcrest Heights Country Club had the option of integrating and allowing uh, people of color into the swimming pools, they voted against it. Mm -hmm. So that's just 64, 65. Yeah. The, um, in 65, as I, I had jumped ahead there before, you were uh, part of a group that formed the Action Coordinating Committee to End Segregation in the Suburbs, or yeah. Access. and. Uh, Tell us a little about that and uh, you know, what, what you were doing and uh, uh, what the results well, of it was. So, you know, and it did lead to our folk. The two things really led to the focus on the Jewish community. One was the rise of black nationalism. Uh, and I remember getting a letter because at that point I was chair of the core chapter. I went down to Julius Hobson's meetings in Washington occasionally very different core chapter um, and our core chapter and um, we uh, we kept on finding as we were looking at segregation that most of the real estate and most of the developments uh, were owned by Jews mm -hmm. and the same situation the slumlords along 7th Street in mm -hmm. Washington DC Ironically, this was also the product of Jews being discriminated in, again, becoming part of law firms and accountant firms, and real estate was one of those few occupations that mm -hmm. was open to Jews in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when we focused uh, on, on this issue of the entire suburbs around the Beltway being uh, almost 100% white. And we had a little bit of a real realization when we, when we joined, when we had a sit-in at uh, uh, Bel Air at Bowie, Maryland, which, you know, I said, well, this is a Jewish Levittown. This is a Jewish-owned development. How could they exclude people of color? But they did, and we sat in, and we all got arrested. Uh, but I got a little bit of an inkling of the nature of segregation and of course knew that parts of Washington DC were, were de facto segregate, segregated to the extent to which people had um, uh, covenants uh, that uh, for, forbade, I don't know when they became illegal, probably sometimes in the 50s. When it was the a Supreme Court decision in the late uh, 40s. But I didn't mean the problem. No, it ended. It, but it, that's that said, you couldn't discriminate against Jews. Yeah, first time I went with my uh, my first wife to uh, meet her parents in Upper Northwest, they said, "Oh, you're you're Jewish." 
and they pulled out their restrictive covenant to show me, oh, no colored, no coloreds, no Asians, and no people of the Judaic persuasion. And they said, well, you could marry our daughter, but you can't own this house ever. For some reason, but they were joking, of course. For some reason, the covenants also include Persians. I don't know about the Persians, but, but Persians are to be suspect, I'm sure. Um, so, um, so, so we did. Access, we formed yeah. Access, yeah. and we marched around the Beltway. Uh, the Beltway had just kind of recently been built. Yeah, I yeah. Think. yeah it had and we had banners, and it was well publicized. And I think in a couple of cases, trucks tried to hit us, or cars tried to hit us. It was a big march. I don't know how many miles it was. Mm -hmm. and, and in the evening, we would speak at various churches and stay at the churches and talk about the patterns of segregation. And, uh, and it was a good consciousness raiser. It, it was uh, both uh, black and white. Uh, I wasn't the chair of it, uh, it was Howard University student. Yeah, Chuck yeah. Jones. Uh, yeah, Chuck Jones. There, it was, you know, it, still there were patterns of segregation all around. I remember how shocked I was when I was invited at a core meeting to a party mm -hmm. in, in Rhode Island Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I was the only white person there. It was above a jazz club. And um, uh, same thing. I just kept on seeing in the 60s the segregation pattern mm -hmm. in, among friends, homes. In fact, there's a little irony. I had a part-time job for the Bureau of Social Science Research. Mm -hmm. And I think Art Grossman might have had that same job. I'm not sure. Well, we run a, went around, and it wasn't... It wasn't I'm not sure. It was a study on police community relations mm -hmm. for a federal for a federal study. And I was assigned to different neighborhoods to ask them questions about police community relations. Mm -hmm. And as we went up Upper Northwest along 16th Street, I hit a place called what was then called the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. So the first door I knocked on in the neighborhood took up what appeared to be almost a solid block. And a, uh, a black woman opened the door, and I said, uh, is, is the lady of the house in? And she said, I am the lady of the oh, house. <laughs> so I said, whoops. I said, I'm sorry. It's a little shocking based on what I've seen elsewhere. But it was part-time work, and I had these mm -hmm. questions about. And, and most of the homes nearby were strictly white. I just stumbled across an isolated example mm -hmm. of uh, upper middle income, right. really middle income. Um, people of color owning uh, their own homes. Who are some of the people involved in Access? It's probably worth uh, mentioning some of their names. Well, Al and Margaret McShirley right. stand out. And yeah. Al is around today. Sure. And I, I think so is Margaret mm -hmm. McShirley. Yes. And um, I, uh, they kind of stand out. Uh, and Al went on, and I remember visiting him down in Kentucky, outside right. of Pikesville. Right. And uh, we were going to stay in his house, uh, and, and Al and Margaret, who were organizers against strip mines, said, you know, you better go to the campground. We're having a little bit of problems here. Yeah. And, and that night, that, the room we would have stayed in was dynamited, yeah. or the whole house was dynamited. Yeah. That. So, uh, Their son was, the little baby son was in a crib in there. Right, too, yeah. right, and then uh, quack. It was Kentucky House on Un Un-American Activities Committee. They were charged with conspiring to overthrow Pike County, Kentucky. Right, among other things. Went to the Supreme Court, and yeah. they eventually did win a bit of money, which put uh, yeah. Al through law school, yeah. I think. And yeah. uh, uh, so Chuck Jones, and uh, the thing about Chuck Jones was he would call people by their first names. You know, he'd say, well, Martin and I were whatever. He was talking about Martin Luther King. <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or he was on a first name basis with a lot of people. And, and to th when I thought about it, there were people I came in contact with that I knew from SDS. Like, I think Chuck McDoo was one of those people. There were a bunch of people I knew from early SDS mm -hmm. who ended up in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so there were, and, uh, John Gibson or Josh Gibson, I forget, one of them, uh, one of their brothers was, 
-hmm. was very involved on national issues. So mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it was Josh, and it was a it was a for the time a fairly well integrated group. I just came across the mailing list of all the people. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, but but we kept on getting into this issue. Eventually being accused by the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith as singling out Jews. Because of the apartment buildings yeah, they were targeting. Yeah, they were all owned by Jews, yeah. uh, uh, the apartment buildings in the suburbs. I remember there was uh, in Silver Spring, and uh, Arlington, you picketed. Uh, well, we were counted picketed by uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, I remember, mm -hmm. Nazis dressed up mm -hmm. as Nazis. They were Nazis, <laughs> and they were across yes. the street. And we also had... Yeah, they were very strong in Northern Virginia. Yeah. yeah, but we also had the Ku Klux Klan that came out. I mean, I was kind of shocked. There's a guy named Edwards with the Ku Klux Klan. Right? Well, yeah. uh, they came out in full regalia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when they, uh, it was, it was kind of shocking to see, you know, so close, you know. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. So here's this guy, and, and we, at this point we're, you know, it's funny, we're, we're, they were... We were protesting in neighborhoods that are now 100% black. Mm -hmm. So uh, these these neighborhoods we were picketing were then white. And um, uh, what's that publication, by the way? That well, we we uh, it was one of one of these movement publications right. that focused on fair housing and right. a lot of the a lot of the stuff we were doing back then. And uh, when you mentioned the Ku Klux Klan, the, uh, what, tell us the story of uh, that being taken over by various Well, it was the White Citizens Council. Uh, oh, person sorry, the White Citizens Council. The person that sorry. joined the yeah. group, uh, Norman Kilpatrick, who was from the South, and, and bragged that the Southern tradition included in its history, or at least parts of uh, Appalachians, there was uh, an anti-racist part of the tradition. Uh, especially in the mountain land where there was no history of slavery, mountain areas. So Norman had joined the White Citizens Council, which w were meeting right near Tacoma Park off New Hampshire Avenue. And he got us all to join the chapter and then approached um, a prominent black minister, Channing Phillips, right. got him to join. And then we all, uh, uh, he came in with uh, this black minister and several others, and we, we had a picket line that formed outside of the house, um, uh, picketing the concept of you know, racism and what the White Citizens Council stood for. And when Channing Phillips showed up and showed his membership card, these people just ran like roaches. And, uh, and outside, they were greeted by black and, and white people picketing. And, when, and that, killed the chapter. <laughs> but but it's, you know, the, the level of racism in Montgomery County at that point, the the council, I think, were all Republicans, or virtually all Republicans. They were, one uh, there were two very conservative Democrats on it. But yeah, segregationist uh, John Henry Heiser owned the Heiser Theater, which he closed down yeah, rather than integrate. Than integrate uh, yeah. There were a lot of yeah. places like that in uh, I don't think today people realize how racist things were, how anti-Semitic, uh, how, uh, mm -hmm. how these areas were, uh, were incredibly racist to the point where when we demonstrated against Summit Hills Apartments, right behind it mm -hmm. was um, a cooperative started with, by Margaret Milgram, mm -hmm. purposely mm -hmm. having uh, a 50-50 rate of people of color and white people and, and trying to not repeat the pattern caused by redlining mm -hmm. uh, once people of color moved in, white people moving out. Mm -hmm. Sometime, I guess it was 1965, you uh, began to work as a social worker at oh, Montgomery yeah. County. It all ties into this. Yeah. And uh, going about your job and then one noon you decide to go out on a picket line. Well, the picket line was because Heiser and this Republican... He's a council member, John. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was... Uh, I thought he was more... I thought he was the executive director. But you think he was a councilman? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... Um, he was his guy that he was putting on. Guys yeah. That he was putting on. So, um, so I was called in. There were 
there was a series of demonstrations that the core chapter had when they appointed two segregationists to the Human Relations Commission and also sliced the funding from something like 12,000 to, I don't know, 900. Yeah, it was a bit of a farce of a Human Relations Commission, right, to say and, the least. Yeah. And they appointed um, uh, the uh, local person from, uh, uh, what was that crazy group in New England? Anyway, uh, two off-the-wall groups that were segregationist and, and uh, based on the group that was threatening to, uh, that the communists were putting water in the reservoirs, of, of putting in, no, into the, um, uh, they were, anyway, they were poisoning our water. Fluoride. Fluoride, yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. So what was the Our group? Bodily fluids. Yeah, yeah, bodily fluids. John Birch. John Birch. John Birch. So, oh, so the yeah, local yeah, head okay. of the John Birch Society, <laughs> and, and and some other outrage could have been the White Citizens Council, but another equally absurd group. They appointed them as a farce to the human. So we were picketing them, and um, one was the Reverend Adams. Right? Reverend Adams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and this is during your lunch hour. When you were doing no, this was at night. Month. This was at night. Oh, I thought so the doing. next day after one of those demonstrations was filmed and I was spotted, uh, I was called into the director's office of the welfare department and told that it was conduct unbecoming a county employee and, uh, and was fired on the spot. Go yeah. get your stuff. So this is from the Afro-American. Um, that And there was a lot of publicity around yes. it. Reverend Zorhai, a Unitarian uh, minister, a bunch of other people formed a defense, defense committee, but, uh, um, uh, but uh, you know, I was fired. And there, in the Sentinel, there was a, a great cartoon done by uh, Kesselbaum. Oh, yeah, Bob Kesselbaum. Bob Kessenbaum. Yeah. Kessenbaum. Yeah. And it, it, uh, it showed me being booted out, um, and uh, I guess the caption was along the lines of, uh, Social social uh, worker shouldn't be concerned with human rights and, and <laughs> yeah, human dignity or something along right. those lines. Yeah. Right. And he was so, good. He was good. so and no, but I mean, he worked for uh, a top secret agency as a graphic designer, and they didn't know that he also did the cartoons for the Daily World. Oh. There was an incident there when he was told to bring his cartoons when they had an employee art day. And they said, I don't think you want to see my cartoons. And he brought them to Doc Inc. Uh -huh. And was also fired. Went back down to Kentucky uh -huh. okay. and became the head of the uh, Department of Social Welfare there because he was only only one of that county who had a college degree. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a little before this that, uh, I mean, as I always say, that you're one of the few people I can trace exactly to the day that I met you. It was two days after the SDS first big anti-war demonstration in Washington on oh, yeah. April 17th, so I met you wow. on April 19th. So I helped organize that march, I remember. There was there were marches all over the country. That one had something like 20,000 yeah. people. 20, so, yeah, 20, yeah. So, that year uh, was? 1965. Yeah. So I remember organizing protests around. I guess the other thing before I, I mean, I'm, you know, these things all trigger memories. So I tried to get down before I worked for the, well, I was still a, a graduate student, I tried to get down to Selma for the original mm -hmm. march. Mm -hmm. And in order to get down, number one, someone had to pay for you. Uh, number two, you had to represent some group. So I, I tried and I could not, couldn't get a Jewish group to um, have a presence there at that point. So was, this was the first Selma march mm -hmm. to cross the Pettus Bridge. And, um, and so I f tried the Quakers, no. Uh, uh, they, they, they were a little bit afraid of the violence. And then I got, because I was attending um, a Unitarian church uh, uh, for a while on uh, New Hampshire Avenue, I think. Anyway, I was attending a Unitarian church and they said, well, no one else wants a volunteer, so you could be the Unitarian representative. So I packed my bags and then early in the morning, I got a call, 7 a.m., no, we've, uh, you're actually a Jew, and uh, we've actually found a legitimate Unitarian minister whose name is uh, James Reeb mm -hmm. to represent the Unitarian Church in Selma, and of course he was killed. Yeah. And yeah. so it's one of these you know, crossroads in your life. Well, 
I like to believe I was too street savvy for that to happen. However, when I once went to a, uh, and, and I just, this was a recent memory, so when I went down to a SOC conference, Southern Students Organizing Committee, so it was the group that was going to be in harmony with, with SNCC, um, and, uh, and I remember organizing near Durham, it was only going to be for a week, and um, there was a black-owned hotel, and we went out as a Congress of Racial Equality group of organizing, and we were going into sharecroppers' areas, white and black, near each other, registering people to vote. Mm -hmm. So there was one guy across the dirt road, and there was me on the other side, and a car pulls up, and uh, uh, there were about four or five kids. They could have been 15 or 16, mm -hmm. but they did come out with baseball bats and, uh, and lead mm -hmm. pipes. And I said, what, are these guys, what could I do? These guys are going to outrun me. And uh, they said, why, why are white people nigger lovers? I, we don't, where are you from? Mm -hmm. and, um, and why are you, be, you know, they were asking me a bunch of questions. I said, you know, wait, 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 wait. You know, you have to understand, I'm really not white. <laughs> I said, I'm <laughs> Jewish. And I just saw that lead pipe come right down and I don't remember anything else. I woke oh up God. I woke up in a hospital and then someone took me back to uh, uh, College Park. And Jesus. it was, I had forgotten the memory even. It, maybe five years ago it was tribute, uh, tri Jesus. something triggered it and I forgot about it, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, so this, this issue of, again, the role of Jews and you try to disarm the racism because I never could understand the racism. It was beyond my understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry for getting derailed. No, that was good. That was same, same thing uh, when, when we were organizing in, um, uh, in Cedar Heights and Fairmont Heights in Prince George's County. We organized a bus to go down to Atlantic City uh, to join uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, the challenge to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was there. I think for two days, and I must have slept on the beach mm -hmm. because I remember just holding up that sign of Mick, of Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. Mm -hmm. So there were three of us holding it up, massive sign, mm -hmm. and uh, got to meet Fannie Lou Hamer and got to form an intense identity with, not that I really knew any of them, with SNCC mm -hmm. and uh, with the SNCC people. And then I remember that and, and my distrust of white liberals and the Democratic Party just, I realize, has remained in me mm -hmm. to this day. Yeah, that story's been, from your perspective, tell that story, though, of what the sellout well, of the... Uh, yeah, the I mean, it was a sellout. Uh, 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 LBJ, um, the, the attempt was to get the delegation seated, and there was a lot of haggling over, well, maybe, maybe what was his name, Aaron Henry and Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, can be seated, but they didn't want to lose the South. The Democratic Party did not want to lose the South. So there was a lot of wrangling, and I remember Ray Wilkins was involved with the NAACP, um, as, was, uh, uh, as was Martin Luther King, as was Joe Rao representing, what, the UAW? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were haggling to get, to get the party seated, or minimally to allow some seating. And I remember Bob Moses would just not back down. And SNCC would not back down. And uh, James Foreman would not back down. And so there was an attempt to allow Fannie Lou Hamer to speak. And the, the quote from uh, LBJ was, I'm not a letting some uh, colored or maybe worse illiterate farm woman speak on the floor of the Democratic National Convention. I think it was worse than that. Yeah. And uh, and I think that was echoed by, by Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember at one point there was this dialogue. I mean, I'm getting this from the conversations we had at night. I, I didn't yeah. witness any of this. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, at one point, he points to Bob Moses and said, you're the boss. He said, you go and negotiate. And, and Moses said, no, no, no. It doesn't work the way the Democratic Party works. This is, this is a real democratic group. We're not the Democratic Party. There's no boss. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and Humphrey was horrible, and mm -hmm. as were the Democrats. 
And to this day, starting with the hero, uh, um, John F. Kennedy, who, who at best, at best, was fiddling with uh, corporate liberalism, I think is what Paul Potter called it, finessing the system, which went up right through Hillary Clinton, which is why so many of us distrusted Hillary Clinton and back Bernie Sanders, you know, that basically corporatism w would work. You just had to tweak it. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I just developed an intense distrust for the Democratic Party and liberals in general, mm -hmm. and so connected with, uh, um, you know, after <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer was representing three or 400,000 people of color in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this illiterate woman that had been. This is, yeah. So. The, um, the, when you did, uh, we're, we're back in, uh, in Washington, uh, when you been, when you were fired from the, uh, uh, as a social worker, what did you do then? Well, I tried, I got, I got a few jobs, but. <laughs> I did lose those jobs. I worked for Big Brothers of the National Capital Area. My boss was Bernie Charon, who was, again, a kind of a white liberal, nice white liberal. He took me out for lunch pretty regularly. I got to go to restaurants I couldn't go to. All we could afford back then was a right-wing Cuban mess restaurant yes. called the Omega. Oh, yeah, talk about the Omega. Well, I don't, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to it if you remind <laughs> me, but, but talk about conspiracy. So he took me out to these really good restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, La Sanda del, del, del Sol, and I remember the, the, the owner coming around with his wine skin and, and letting the open the mouth and the wine would flow into your mouth. Yeah. He was a nice guy and it was a good liberal group, Big Brothers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, he started, he said, Mike, I'd like to come to some of these meetings, I know you. And we had a meeting every night. Every mm -hmm. night there was a meeting. So when I see people who can't join an organization, because there might be a meeting once a month, I, of course, get angry. Uh, but um, so he said, why don't you take me to some of these meetings? And I said, you know, Bernie, I don't know how you. So I took him to an access meeting. And he kept on calling Margaret McShirley, who was a very tough woman, uh, honey. Kept on calling her honey. And finally, she turned around in this meeting and said, if you motherfucker call me, honey, one more time, you're going to wake up with an ax in your head. And I was fired a week or two later. <laughs> but when I realized that, you know, this group I was relating to, was, he was a little bit beyond the age. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so that was one firing. I, I worked for the University Neighborhoods Council, which was an offshoot of something that, uh, that uh, uh, went father... Bill, Father William Went yeah. uh, at St. Stephen's and the Incarnation, one of the main, one of these magic things. St. Stephen's was the host for most marches and mobilizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, Father Went hired me. I, I had known him. I said I was out of a job. I needed a job to pay rent and whatever. And he hired me, and, my, and it, it was a project out of Howard University called Baker's Dozen. And uh, this was an attempt at street corner organizing. So we were organizing in Columbia Heights, which was pretty all black, except for Gerard Street, which was the first, uh, Bruce Terrace organized the first uh, rehab uh, uh, street along Gerard Street. And it was a pretty tough neighborhood. I know I really was warned not to stay around at night. Uh, and. Uh, and it also cut into Adams Morgan. I remember I ran a, a war on rats project and uh, learned a lot, but uh, I didn't have an MSW. What, was year, was that? what year was, was that? Well, it was right after I was so 60, fired. 60, 65, 66. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, uh, I loved the restaurants in the neighborhood, I loved the people. And I got to know Seventh Street. I got I got to really understand the inner city a little bit mm -hmm. better than I had, mm -hmm. and I had all this time, you know, to organize. So mm -hmm. I got to meet a lot of people and uh, understand a lot of things and try to um, try to focus energies on something that, to this day, I mean, there are still rats, <laughs> and the war on rats is 
a war yes. for peace and justice, you know? We still lack it, we still don't have it. Uh, but, um, uh, and then after that, there was one other job. Oh yeah, there was a Bureau of Social Science Research job. Uh-huh. And, then, uh, and then someone suggested that I join, oh, I knew the Berrigan brothers. Uh-huh. And, um, uh, and someone suggested I get involved with a Catholic men's group, which I did. I went to regular meetings of this, this uh, Catholic men's group. And we met at a restaurant called The Old Stream. And I, it was where you could go in and have a lunch for about a buck fifty, uh, and uh, uh, near Dupont Circle. And I got to meet all these great people. And uh, and I remember once uh, we went to a Catholic peace conference, and I met Father McSorley. And, and McSorley came in, and uh, he was introduced as a professor at Georgetown and a Jesuit. Uh-huh. So uh, Phil Berrigan introduced me and uh-huh. said, um, uh, and he said, you know, Father McSorley is the confessor for the Kennedy family. <laughs> and, and I said to him, oh, I said, that's incredible. I said, I hope you're taking really good notes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then uh, Phil said, y- you know, uh, Mike actually isn't Catholic. He's really Jewish. <laughs> and, and so he doesn't, he doesn't really quite know about, well, it turns out years later after he died, he was taking notes. And, uh, and they found it in, among his papers of, of some of these uh, Kennedy, and they sequestered it away for 100 years. But that appeared in the Washington Post. It must be true. Oh, yeah, right. So, so uh, I think it is. I think it is true. So I'm, I'm off track. But, but one, one thing we haven't talked about, but when you mentioned McSorley, was it McSorley that was coming out of Robert McNamara's office at the Pentagon? Yeah, we you, were. You were sitting in. Yeah, we were sitting in. He had just been to our wedding where, where you were. Uh-huh. I think you were at the wedding. Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. Halloween. Halloween? Halloween. <laughs> Halloween. Oh, yeah, we had a, Halloween we had a motif. We had a cake. With witches and goblins on it, you're right. Yeah, it's very. And it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a father, I don't know how, but Father McSorley showed up with this incredibly. He always came with blonde-haired women. I don't know why, but uh, and uh, uh, and so, yeah, he showed up, and uh, all, yeah, a bunch of really interesting people, and you and Debbie were there, and Debbie uh, wasn't there. no, Debbie wasn't there. Oh. Then the question is, did I really introduce you to Debbie? So you did. I did not. <laughs> so, uh, so we were uh, sitting in, in the Pentagon. So at that point, all you had to do to get into the Pentagon was yeah. show your identification card. And I remember about 30 of us, we said, well, let's split up. It doesn't look good for 30 people dressed like us to be walking around the Pentagon. And um, so what's this? This is 64, 65. 60, yeah, 65, 60, 65, 65, 65. Okay. So we're on our way to McNamara's office. I think it's McNamara's yeah. office. Yeah. And, um, and we come in and we, we sit in, 30 of us, and we say we want to meet with him. We don't have an appointment. And uh, we're sitting in and out walks Father McSorley with uh, McNamara, kind of almost arm in arm. And he looks down and he sees me there and he said, Mike, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing there? <laughs> and I gave him the leaflet. And the leaflet said, um, said, we are here to protest the support, Defense Department support of segregated housing. And we were calling for an end of um, uh, if, if a person uh, was in the military and they lived in off-base housing, uh, we, we were asking that it be declared, which I think it was, illegal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that money from the federal government and uh, Defense Department shouldn't be used to support segregated housing. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, let me take this with me. And when they came back from lunch, we were still there, and he said, uh, Mike, how long do you all plan to be here? And I said, well, I mean, until something gets signed or until they arrest us. And he, he went in with McNamara and then came out and says, come on in and signed an order right, right there, then, right yeah. on the spot. And uh, that's, my, that's what my memory uh, mm-hmm. tells me. And uh, shook our hands and, uh, and left. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was the most successful action yeah. I think I'd ever been in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so everything else drug out, everything else was never resolved, everything else took a mm-hmm. lot of time. 
Bob yeah, because Town. all those military bases in Virginia, particularly, was focused on that they were all off off-site housing. Was, yeah, was it was it was one of those rare achievements where you get mm -hmm. immediate satisfaction. So I do, and once again, I was not. There were thirty of us. I wasn't responsible for this. There was just a series of circumstances that happened, and it reminded me a little bit of the Walden Pond question on but what are you doing there yeah what are you doing there what are you doing there mm -hmm. but the poetic justice that he had just been to the wedding mm -hmm. the um, see we mentioned uh, probably be jumping back and forth on this but uh, various people that you met were that were memorable certainly for one way or another you mentioned Brent Dillingham uh, I have here something that on white uh, privilege, white racism, a paper that you were involved in. I have here in my hand, yes. So uh, tell we, us about uh, Yeah, so that was, that, right, was that was right here at IPS. We were, I forget the name of the group, but we were studying, and again, this could be today, so 19, sometime in the 60s, I, you know, this is out of context, but we were studying Perfect. white skin privilege. It's on the front. The Emergency yeah, so Committee. The yeah, it's looking at the date. It's it has like, no date. Center for Emergency Support. Yeah, so. well, we were studying uh, uh, white skin privilege. And I don't think there's a date there. I looked. Okay. And in the group were a number of people connected with IPS, plus uh, uh, Arthur Waskow, plus a number of other people, some of whom I knew, some of whom I didn't. I don't think Marcus Raskin, but it was, it was mostly SDS people, and Arthur was involved mm -hmm. in SDS. So Kathy Wilkerson was there, and I guess I always had a little bit of a thing for Kathy, except she was turning into a very strong Maoist, mm -hmm. and I was kind of mainstream, new left, Port Huron statement, part of the way with LBJ, left socialist at best, mm -hmm. with a little bit of uh, anarchism thrown in. Uh, what was his name? Bookchin. Murray Bookchin, was that his mm -hmm, name? Yeah, I, I remember reading him a lot. And, uh, but I definitely was not dogmatic. And bringing Mao, bringing the war home was something that, I, I never used the word pigs, because when I grew up in the housing project, most of the Irish kids' fathers were police, and they uh, have nice, memorable exchanges with those cops. They were nice people. So I never got into the pig thing. and. Um, and I just kept on hearing this horrible set of beliefs about how we'd end the war. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the weather underground. Yeah, this was a little bit before. Well, the weather underground was just forming. Forming, yeah. So I was on my way up to New York City one day, at some point later, and who should I run into at Union Station but Kathy Wilkerson? And I remember she was wearing this uh, uh, undergarment that was loaded with little delicate flowers and angels on it, and I, the incongruity of it, um, of this, this person with severe left politics and that, that uh, uh, really pretty crinoline or whatever the thing was underneath. So I, she said, well, let's sit together and let's talk. I said, as long as we don't talk politics. So we rode up to New York City together, and then I remember she hugged me and she said, I might not see you again in the near future. And then when I came back, and I don't know if it was right away, it, but I read about this house being blown up uh, in the East Village. Mm -hmm. And it was her parents' house, and her and Kathy Boudin barely had their clothes on, if they did. And the person who was making the bombs, all they found, I think, was his finger. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a bomb house for the weathermen. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, it's just another one of those interesting memories. Yeah. Um, who are some of the other... Uh, well, Brent, I, I, I'll talk about Brent, but, yeah. uh, you know, I knew in passing, although I have to say I was never comfortable with intellectuals. I really, uh, I mean, I knew Paul Booth a little bit. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Heather. I knew Paul Potter. I knew these people because I went to SDS regional and national meetings. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, I felt a lot more comfortable with CORE. I remember when Julius Hobson, the chapter, kept on being put in the receivership. Hobson was a very, very complex person. And at, at one point, George Wiley came down and uh, was temporary chairperson. And um, 
And again, I was in my early 20s, so I was kind of in awe. But Wiley eventually started with, I think, Tim, Sam Tim Sampson, the most amazing thing, a welfare rights organization. Mm -hmm. And it was incomprehensible that they could organize women on welfare. Mm -hmm. And got to know him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was a real national tragedy when he died in a boat capsizing on the Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. And I, I just saw, I was just looking at our Freedom Seder in 1969, and I saw a picture of his son. I don't know where he is today, mm -hmm. I'm sure he's around. Uh, his mother used to shop at our farmer's market. Um, and, uh, you know, but that was a real tragedy, George Wiley. Uh, and uh, I got to know a lot of people, but I, I really did not go to too many national meetings. I really stayed local. Mm -hmm. I, my organizing was always local organizing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wasn't interested, and I, I was also nervous talking at large groups. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I know when we, when we formed feds, federal employees mm -hmm. for a democratic society, I, I spoke, but, but I, you know, several hundred people out in the audience, I always got nervous. Let's, let's back to that, yeah. because you started working for the federal... Well, but the, uh, Brent yeah. Dillingham, I didn't okay, want to forget right, yeah. Brent, because cause that's one of the reasons we started this project, so <laughs> that people like Brent would not be forgotten. I mean, mm -hmm. Brent was an amazing guy. And I was on the board of something called Compeers. I don't mm -hmm. know what Compeers stood for, but there was a kind of a freedom house of sorts in Bethesda. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked with local high school students, mm -hmm. including, uh, what's his name? Norman that, Solomon. Yeah, Norman Solomon, who became well known. And, uh, but uh, Brent, his wife, his extended family, Josh, all those people, was an amazing group of people. And all Irish, traditionally Irish, I, I didn't know too many except a little bit in the housing project, Irish people, but yes. it was quite an adventure. He, um, and, and the, the Compeers was also involved in the great boycott, which you became involved yeah. in too, the, uh, yeah. up till, you know, 67, 68, 69. Yeah, Jean Bottillier was the national organizer and the group we started, Jews for Urban Justice, it was one of our projects. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Brent was just an amazing force and um, he's one of these people that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to realize that people go on and yet these amazing people with amazing minds, amazing spirit, die. Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember people like him. But he always remembered me at crucial events. And uh, I remember getting up at meetings and denouncing liberals <laughs> in a room. Yes. And uh, that, that, that was very funny to him. <laughs> but one of the people I denounced, Atlee Scheidler, I mean, I think it's okay to say his name. I'm sure he's passed away. But when I got hired, um, by one of the places when I was looking for a job. UPO, I was hired by Al McShirley. I was fired the same day because Atlee Scheidler said, this guy can't work for me. You know, he denounced me at a meeting. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and he said to Al, Al told me, he said, either he's going to fire, you have to leave or I have to leave. And I'm sure you're going to find another job I can't afford to be fired also. I mean, there's always something as a reporter at the Montgomery County Sentinel, which we mentioned earlier, I, uh, and then at the Washington Star and Washington Post. I mean, there's always a lot of news coming out of all of my friends who were either getting arrested or, or, or fired or in some sort of troublemaking capacity. <laughs> well, I didn't view it. I mean, uh, look, I was not totally you know, serious about everything. I all tried to have a sense of humor about yeah. what was happening and the ludicrousness. I mean, in the end, the best person and the worst person to work for was myself. I was destined to keep on being fired. I had another incident um, where when I got the equivalent of a master's from the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. I, uh, I was, uh, got interviewed by an assistant superintendent in the D.C. school system. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking at that point of becoming a teacher before I applied to become a social worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, Mr. Tabor, it looks like you got good credentials. And he said, the only thing is uh, I need to know, uh, where would you like to work 
in Washington, D.C. So this was 60, 65. And I said, well, I was thinking of Anacostia or um, somewhere in Northeast. And then he looked at me and completely seriously said, Mr. Tabor, are you a member of the Communist Party? So I had to think. I said, well, maybe, maybe I joined a group without knowing it. <laughs> and I, I said, maybe I was a member. I said, no, no, I wasn't a member of the Communist Party. Why do you ask? He said, why would we take a white boy with postgraduate background and put him in a colored neighborhood? Why would we do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, where would you put me? He said, well, um, uh, Upper Northwest, Wilson High School, something like that. We wouldn't waste Mm -hmm. Your background has put you in a colored neighborhood. It's unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So I kind of added to the concept the, yeah. of, I yeah. don't know how long I'm going to last in this, yeah. in this um, world of bureaucracies and teachers and eventually, mm -hmm. of course, social work. It was, it was the past that was haunting mm -hmm. the new left and those of us who really believed in freedom now and change and difference. So we were up against the 50s and the 40s and people's minds that were still instilled in segregation and anti-communism, fear of the left, and fear of, I mean, it's amazing how things have turned around, fear of Russia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, that, but you did go to work for the federal government, and you were... Yeah, I got in through that Catholic men's group. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one guy, um, I mean, these people are all dead. I probably don't have to worry about naming their names. Mm. Uh, uh, what was his name, though? Anyway, one guy um, uh, was involved in this Catholic uh, men's group. Um, I think his name was McIntosh. And he said, well, he's a person with your background. He said, just submit some papers, some background. You don't have to take a test. And sure enough, I got in as a uh, GS, I don't know, 11, something like that. Mm which now would pay good money, then yeah. probably didn't even pay $15,000. And uh, got in at the Office of Education, working in migrant education. Mm -hmm. And within six months, got a job in, in uh, the Office of, uh, in, uh, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Office of the Secretary. I met some really good people. I remember Alvin Shore, the brother of uh, the national commentator, Oh, Daniel Schwartz. Daniel Schwartz's brother, Alvin. I met really good people, mm -hmm. and they said, well, we need you here. And they didn't, I don't know if they knew what they were asking for, because <laughs> I knew I didn't have a long-range career in the federal mm -hmm. government. But I did stay there for five to six years and learned a lot mm -hmm. and wasn't serious about making a career of it. So we started all kinds of groups within the federal government. Yeah, one uh, federal employees for a democratic society, which just boggles the mind that such an organization once yeah. existed within the federal government. But tell us yeah. about that. So, so here I, I did come across this last night. Um, you know that we had formed actually, we put out a paper and called the uh, the condition of the federal employee and how to change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, feds, we we'll call ourselves feds. Mm -hmm. and uh, circulated the paper. And next thing we knew, we had several thousand people on mm -hmm. demonstrations when there would be a national march holding mm -hmm. signs, HUD, Labor Department, HEW, and for these huge anti-war marches. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't view ourselves as being, when we were in the federal service, we didn't think we were working for the president. We felt we were working for the people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, we had, uh, I know the Washington Post refused to, when we, when we had a large petition objecting to the war, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't print it. So uh, See that this Washington uh, Star did. Yeah, so the Star did, did and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but we, looking back, we did things that were so outrageous that uh, the thought of them would you know, it would never occur to people today that there was, people were, were there, doing this kind of stuff. And they had a big dinner in honor of uh, Daniel Ellsberg after the Pentagon Papers, I believe. Yeah, we had, well, yeah. Uh, I Game remember that. I remember we had all these amazing speakers. We started the Thursday discussion group. Mm -hmm. And I remember once, uh, what was his name, Bundy? Was it George Bundy? George Bundy. Is that uh, what I, I, I said, we are, uh, I found a letter. Well, this is, 
this is the letter to him, maybe. We, we wrote around to try and get as high as we could in, in the uh, Johnson administration people to come speak. And I, so I sent a letter to him on HEW stationery, which I shouldn't have done, and asking him to speak to a group of federal employees, employee to employee, worker to worker. And we actually did. Uh, we, we actually, he did come. It was jammed, about this bag lunch group. And I kept on saying, uh, I remember once I had a question, and I said, you know, just between us federal employees, you, you realize that the war is wrong and that what we're doing is, is just sacrificing tens of thousands of Americans, and you do realize it's a waste, don't you? So, uh, <laughs> so you know, what can he say? He said, I'm not coming back, that's what he would say. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and so they attempted, I, I forget who we, who we got to come. I'm going to say it was either Mike Tiger or uh, it, it could have been Stokely Carmichael. But we had an amazing lineup every Thursday. And we did get, they did attempt to shut us down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the ACLU fought it and we won. We were allowed to meet mm -hmm. once a week and have these speakers. And the speakers really, uh, uh, including I.F. Stone and mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and including everyone controversial that we knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point, we had this guy who worked for the uh, Jewish, I forget, it was a Jewish news service. And so, um, who is the main uh, reporter today for CNN? Um, Wolf Blitzer. Well, yeah, Wolf Blitzer. So he came and spoke. And years later, I tried to get him to speak at something else. He said, you, you had this crazy underground at, uh, in the federal government, he said, I don't, I don't really have time for it, but yeah. I always admired the fact that you did this weird stuff. The, um, and, and we did have Abby Hoffman, and we did have Jerry, Jerry Rubin, and we had pretty amazing people. And I know I've asked you before whether you got, if you FOIA your FBI file, which you hadn't done, but from some other files, we know that those uh, Thursday lunch bag sessions were monitored by informers. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, they told me when I left, finally, in the Nixon administration, that it took them to a week to clear out my office. They said some kind of group came in, and we don't know who they were. They never told us, and that they were taking out all kinds of stuff in your office. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, I, I, I might have done, look, the way my week worked is I showed up at 9 o'clock, 9.15, it was time for a coffee break. Uh, uh, we got back uh, from coffee at about a quarter to 10. And then by 11.30, it was time for a lunch break. We got back at 1.30, sometimes 2 o'clock. And then I answered phone calls. And then at uh, 3 o'clock, was time for another coffee break. And 5 o'clock was time to leave. Okay. So I. <laughs> and when did they work on the uh, underground newspaper? <laughs> distributed in there. You know, we, yeah, we did have, we had the advocate, mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, we did take over the local AFGE union, Local 41, mm -hmm. which is how I met, what was his name, it's Josh Williams, Library of oh, Congress. Josh Williams, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was quite, a, it was an interesting network of people, and, and Cornell did a story, um, did a book on, uh, on, on it, a little, you know, like 100 page book mm -hmm. on uh, disaffection in the federal, in federal mm -hmm. employment. And mm -hmm. the Atlantic Monthly did a pretty accurate article. I forget, Elizabeth Drew mm -hmm. was the editor then mm -hmm. um, uh, for Atlantic and did a really good story. What, what about the grants? Yeah. yeah, I would, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but people I knew from SDS, um, um, in, I remember in uh, Newark, New Jersey. There was a, a wonderful project in, in Newark called uh, the Ironbound. It was in the Ironbound, white working class community of what was formerly a steel working area. And I knew people from SDS, and they, they were organizing in that area and needed money. And I remember I would come down there, write it off, because one of my fields of expertise was the white working class issue and how it was important to address, address, address that issue. And I would come up with twenty twenty five thousand dollar R and D grants, 
and fund some of the stuff. And I remember once um, uh, they were marching um, uh, against the mayor of Newark, and I made the mistake of joining the march. Had my picture got in, and they stopped allowing me to go to Newark. That was it. I also did this thing where when Nixon came in, they didn't know what to do with me. So they had me writing, answering letters. Because I had, again, it was at that point, I was GS 13. I kept on being kicked up pay grade by pay grade. And because we won the suit against uh, the Office of the Secretary and worked in the Office of the Secretary, mm -hmm. I think they just decided we better, this guy doesn't care about a future or anything academically or mm -hmm. in, in a future in the federal government. So, you know, he's just going to cause trouble. Let's just let him be. So I, uh, I remember I started answering the letters that went into Nixon. Why is this health center being shut down? Why don't we, why aren't we getting money to do this? Or just, so I started answering them. And I said, you are not getting that funding because you got a toilet called Vietnam. And that's all the money goes. And it was signed, the secretary of HEW. I forget, what was the name of the secretary? Richardson? Well, Richardson was one of them, but, yeah. but there was one who was really embarrassing, who uh, stayed within the Democratic Party, uh, uh, with the Republican Party. Uh, but I, I'd have my secretary put, put his name down, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and finally it got back. They said, uh, Mike, we're, wait, we're, 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 taking, we're taking you off this, uh, this, ish, this, this job of answering letters to the secretary. Uh, we're, we're finding something else. We're not sure what, but we have to find something else for you to do. They, they didn't say how dare you attribute No, to no one at that point. Yeah. They thought I had some secret power uh -huh. somewhere. Uh -huh. uh, I did have somebody in the White House uh, in the previous administration who, uh, who would help, help us along. David North, there was a guy, David North, a good, good guy in the uh, LBJ White House who really helped a lot, and Califano. Mm -hmm. I remember California was, California was kind of mystified at a lot of the stuff we were doing. And I thought he was a decent guy. Mm -hmm. uh, where was he? Uh, was he in the White House? I'm not sure. Yeah, he was, he was big with, yeah. But I remember him taking Joseph, me to a very, yeah. he, he took me to uh, the, executive off, the executive dining room for lunch. And uh, he said, Mike, you could order anything, anything. And they'll bring it to you. That's the way it works. So I, I ordered the hamburger with fries, and uh, uh, <laughs> and that was it. I mean, it's it's still if I ate that kind of food, still it's what I would order. Yeah. But Califano was very. I don't think he was permanent list. I don't, I think he was just trying to figure us out, and mm -hmm. I think he was very sympathetic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He. Uh, uh, let's see. We. So, uh, I guess we skipped over a little bit on the, the great boycott as to what. What was always uh, involved there? I mean, what were some of the things you did? And I realize this might overlap with previous It, it does a little bit, yeah. but, but I, later when I, I got to know a little bit Cesar Chavez, um, and I remember shortly after her daughter was born, there was something going on at the air, oh, it was supporting the, uh, the, uh, the air traffic controllers. Mm -hmm. the, there must have been some type of joint action where say where Chavez oh, yeah. came, yeah, and so um, yeah. and Adina was born, and I I I I guess Esther was working, so I took her with me. I think this is the, what happened, and I saw him, and he and he knew me, and I said, "Would you mind blessing our daughter?" So we have this beautiful picture of Chavez mm -hmm. blessing our mm -hmm. our daughter and, and putting his hand on her head. Mm -hmm. It must have worked because she's doing mm -hmm. good stuff <laughs> uh, as a social worker. In the Bronx, but there um, you did York. with the Great Boycott. You did a lot of not only picket lines, but sort of actions within the. We stores. did street. We did. We yeah. We did. Uh, Brent was involved, and I think Ann Gallivan was involved. Where we we singled out Giant Food Store mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, it, it it was owned both by Jews and by um, a person who had a one percent interest who was politically very sensitive, and we tried to get them, and succeeded at one point in getting them from uh, carrying California grapes. Mm -hmm. and, and we got support of a national board of rabbis 
uh, mm -hmm. uh, declaring uh, uh, a condition of oshek, mm -hmm. a biblical condition when the workers were oppressed, you were not to eat their food. So we did a lot of organizing mm -hmm. in the Jewish community around that and making sure at Sukkot there wouldn't be grapes and sukkahs of Jews. And we actually got something declared here, uh, a level of awareness. But I remember for Joe Danzansky, who was that a giant, yeah, giant 1% owner, I think he was presented with a, an award by B'nai B'rith. And we, we went there. Uh, it was a major hotel. And we handed out our own, uh, you know, we said racists and uh, anti-worker and all these other things. We're giving you an award. Uh, but Jean Batillier was an incredible organizer and a former Episcopalian priest mm -hmm. who, uh, who was involved in this. But we did a lot of street theater, and one of them involved, we went from giant food store to giant food store. And we, uh, we would have a, a pick a line, and then we'd go in, about six or seven of us, and we'd fill our carts with ice cream and all kinds of, I mean, the trouble we were making for the poor workers, I don't know, but we would go from store to store, and we would fill it up, and Brent would ask in a loud voice on a Friday night or Sunday, whenever, and he'd say, he said, surely these are not California grapes violating the workers in California and some of the vilest product, and he just went on and on yes. and on. And he said, are these California grapes? And you know, they called the manager, and he said, well, they are. And then we we had jammed up all the okay. all the cashier belts and cash register belts. Says, I'm not buying here. <laughs> and and not only would we all walk out loading, that actually people did walk out also, mm -hmm. because we chose areas. Uh, in uh, Rockville, Bethesda, areas where there could have been some sympathy. Mm -hmm. But that Brent's loud voice mm -hmm. was really handy at mm -hmm. doing that. And we repeated that for a while until we got an injunction against us. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah. Because our final act was with a rabbi, Harold White, who was mm -hmm. crazy enough to be the only rabbi in the Washington area to actually work with us. So Rabbi White was the uh, chaplain at uh, American University at the time. And uh, he was able to come with us. So we, we came up with this, this concept of taking blood, pouring it on the California grapes. And uh, in, a, in addition to making them unpalatable, declaring that these are the, this was the blood of workers mm -hmm. from California spilled mm -hmm. on the grapes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were about to go until we were arrested from store to store doing that. Mm -hmm. And Harold came up with a, a prayer and um, uh, uh, making the grapes unkosher. And, uh, we, and then they came out with their injunction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to follow through with it. It was expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and eventually they did remove, for that one season, they removed the grapes. Mm -hmm. We weren't letting go. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the Jewish group, Jews for Justice, that I was involved in. Right, yeah. And working working with the larger group. Right, right. Could that you pause for a uh, yeah. moment while I change uh, Yeah, how long? How long have, okay. <laughs> All right, Michael, we're going to talk about a couple of things uh, here. Um, tell us about the uh, group called Community of Micah and what that was about and what you did in the 70, 72 period. Yeah, no, so we, um, we, we had formed this group, Jews for Urban Justice, that, that did come out of both access and Jewish complicity and racism, as well as, um, as, well as a, a way of relating to the history of social justice and Judaism. And in 1969, a year after the death of King, we, um, Arthur Wasco, who was not really involved in the group, was much known as a historian more than anything else here at IPS, joined the group and he, as a way of trying to reconcile the fact that he lived on Wyoming, he was just, you know, he saw the occupation of the National Guard. And uh, we had started the group two years before and we invited him 
to uh, uh, use his Haggadah and do a Freedom Seder. And uh, we did that Freedom Seder, which we're just about to celebrate 49 years later, what's changed by having another Freedom Seder. And he's written a Haggadah, uh, updated Haggadah, to see if much has changed. And it almost appears as if things have gotten worse. So uh, we had that Freedom Seder. 800 people showed up in Channing Phillips's Lincoln Temple, an inner city black church. And it was quite an event. The Canadian Broadcasting Company filmed it, showed it nationally. It wasn't shown much here. Um, and it was quite an event. And, uh, and so we started getting requests um, uh, for copies of that Haggadah. And also, when it was, when it was, um, used, the next year people talked about things that happened at home when they brought the Haggadah to their Seder. And people, uh, people, um, uncles and nephews would break into fistfights over calling Eldridge Cleaver, Cleaver a shaft team or, you know, a kind of a prophet. And uh, there was a lot of tension um, nationally in the community over that, uh, and uh, it, it was obvious that there was a national movement that was starting in the Jewish community. And so we started the community of Micah. Micah Press published uh, Haggadah. Uh, people wanted copies of it all across the country, and there were demands for speakers. And um, in fact, one of the ways I supported myself after I left the federal government in 19, 71 was to go on speaking tours around the country because I was also writing a column in uh, Jewish newspapers on the new emerging Jewish left. And uh, we had um, one particular national meeting in Radnor, Pennsylvania, where I met my uh, wife-to-be, uh, who was then a pigtailed 18-year-old. And it, it took a number of years later when we uh, actually met again. This would be Esther. Yes, Sibbe. yes. So, uh, and she, uh, so, but who knew? And, um, and so a movement arose across the country and of uh, people, Jewish groups addressing those same issues. And we, uh, we had national meetings and, and newspapers and, uh, people began getting very interested in it uh, because there was also an issue of synagogue affiliation and the next generation. After all, we were in our 20s still, not joining synagogues and becoming involved in the Jewish community, communities. So we, uh, we uh, uh, had formed something that became very powerful and led to a lot of people think what's called the Jewish renewal movement, kind of this uh, mix of New Age belief and Buddhism and Hasidism and, uh, and it, it, there's a huge national movement and it might have had its origins in uh, the first uh, National Jewish Organizing Project national meeting at, at Radnor. Um, so that's a big story and there's another interview regarding that. Uh, but it did have repercussions in that Jews for Urban Justice, when it, it, it decided to uh, end, uh, it, it uh, became uh, what, what was named for Brangen, which we still belong to and which we go to, which is, uh, I don't know what's happening, but there are services tomorrow, but because it's a national march, they're either being curtailed or people are marching from the Washington Ethical Society building where we meet um, to join the march, and uh, you know it, it'll. Um, it's still it's one of the sponsors of 49 years later this resurrected anniversary of that first Freedom Seder, and in fact, for Brangen is uh, has come up with $500 as have some of the other groups. $300, $500 to sponsor this Seder that's taking place in another week and a half. 
So, uh, and that's a seder uh, at a Methodist church with uh, a mosque and at least two synagogues and a lot of activists and Arthur Wasco coming down to uh, 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 be part of this new revised Haggadah. Uh, something about the uh, People's Peace Treaty. And the, mm. and the, uh, so I, I have to, um, I have to, I'm not entirely sure, but I think before I quit, I took a week or two off. This is at AGW. Yeah, Nixon. And I think I took time off. I, I don't know that I knew, about, I knew it wasn't legal, but there was something called the People's Peace Treaty in which uh, the idea was uh, if the government wasn't going to end the war, uh, the people had to end the war. So this is, uh, this is a Jewish campaign for the People's Peace Treaty. And uh, we, we decided the best way for Jews to be involved was to um, try to plant trees um, to address the issue of defoliating a lot of Vietnam. And so we went. Um, as a group, um, Jewish group from different parts of the country, to negotiate with the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, and the Buddhists. And so there I am. I believe this is the North Vietnamese. And this is in? This is in Paris, yeah. We thought about going to Vietnam, but we thought that'd be a little extreme. So uh, we stayed with Madame Bin, um, who I had the unofficial... Um, um, residents of the Viet Cong in Paris. Um, and, uh, and we negotiated this peace treaty, more or less, between the Jewish people of America. I don't think most of the Jewish people knew we were doing that, but at least a few thousand did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we raised money, which was used for uh, medicine and trees and re refoliation. And, uh, the North Vietnamese were a bunch of very serious hombres. We, we did get along really well with the Viet Cong. And, uh, but in the end, I think the money went through the Buddhists. Did you get in, any repercussions from this? Uh, from if they knew about it, no one, no one called me in and said, uh, you know, holy cow, you know, you can't, you can't do this, as, especially as a federal employee. It's embarrassing. <laughs> no one said that to me. Uh, but uh, we just went ahead with it. I didn't have any great career in the federal government, mm -hmm. and uh, they had tried stopping us before. And they, I mean, I believe I was looking to get fired at that point and realized that there was no way I was going to stay. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's just part of... I didn't have any particular fear, nor did a lot of other people some of who'd stayed mm -hmm. longer. And a lot of this organizing, uh, although it started early in the agencies downtown, it really spread like wildfire at NIH mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. I mean, NIH was just mobilized. I think they probably had, in the anti-war demonstrations, the largest contingent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, and I, I always, uh, I, I was involved in several attempts to plant trees uh, um, uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians, between the Vietnamese and the Jews, and you know it's just one of these things, the tree being a symbol of, of life, um, both not just for Jews but for everybody. So uh, uh, and we did uh, so that that. Uh, so in 1972, um, there was a rise of people. Um, I don't know when the draft, what year the draft ended, but but once the draft ended, 72, I think. Really, so, uh, there was an ease in the anti-war movement, and uh, I found myself in a study group on uh, looking at. Uh, uh, looking at communes, uh, Walden, Walden II. We were studying Walden II at the Washington Ethical Society, a number of other places. And then a, a group, the same Jewish group, NJOP, 
decided that would be, uh, have an attempt at forming a commune, a uh, kibbutz in a rural area. And I said, you know, last year we actually bought a farm for a ridiculously inexpensive bit of money as a retreat place, as a place to get away. Um, and in fact, Arthur uh, and Irene Waskow and the kids rented it the first summer, used it. And I said, I said the mortgage is $100 a month. So if we want to start this diaspora kibbutz, which involved about 45 people, some people coming up on the weekends. And, but, but for me, it actually turned into a vocation. And uh, I said, you know, uh, a guy a long time ago said, you're your own worst boss. So I had all this experience working for other people. And I decided really the on, only way I was going to be happy is if I ventured out on my own. And I did. I got seriously involved in farming. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year, uh, we started with animals. I blew my federal retirement, the money I'd saved up. Uh, but uh, two years ago, it marked uh, 40, 44 years mm -hmm. of uh, farming. And uh, it's turned into a worker-run farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it's fairly successful in terms of its serving uh, low-income people as well as middle-income people as well as uh, a number of colleges and a, a, a co-op. And so I don't know that you could see this, but there's a picture here, 1972, the first crew of workers from the commune, and then 2015, the most recent group. And uh, so uh, it's 44 years. We never did this again, calendar. Uh, a few years ago, uh, 44 years of farming. Did you give it the name? Licking Creek. Licking Creek is on the title. Uh, it is. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we didn't give it the name. That was just a natural name. And uh, we and we've been involved in a lot of local social justice stuff. Uh, more recently, we're involved with the community in fight in fighting CAFOs. So CAFOs are confined animal feed operations. And because Pennsylvania is a right-to-farm state, a CAFO, that is a large hog-raising operation with like 10,000 hogs, can locate itself in the middle of a rural community which, without much um, necessary input from the residents. So we're successfully fighting. I mean, I've joined in for support. The people there are fighting CAFOs successfully. And, uh, I also got involved in a number of other farm-related issues, and it's uh, uh, it's something that uh, that I, that I've been. Um, we did we did get 500 people to oppose um, a a uh, nuclear waste dump, a proposed nuclear waste dump in our area because we're right by the crossing of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. It was the ideal place, a company called Chem Nuclear, mm -hmm. to put a uh, chemical waste dump in. And actually, they were starting, the county commissioners had approved it. We were successful at turning out 500 people at a county meeting mm -hmm. to oppose it, and it stopped. Uh, you also, um, of course, the uh, farmer's market in D.C. Yeah, we started what we think might have been the first outside of Eastern Market uh, the, there were no laws. We were lucky enough to have David Clark kind of shop at the market at first. He was the. He was a shopper, and he was the what? Council, council member later. That David Clark. Yeah. Council chair later. Yeah. So he came to the market. There was opposition to developing anything on the corner of 18th Street um, and Columbia Road. In fact, there was opposition. I'm not sure um, a number of militant people in the neighborhood opposed a gas station on that corner. Eventually a bank come in, came in and the bank tried to eliminate the market and the market space unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. And the community just rose up uh, um, against it, wanting to propose that open space, assuming that uh, it, it was legal to continue to, that there was a right of way and we were able to have community gathering places. And right now, that's under dispute. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, a realtor 
he is de determined to build a condo in that space. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question of community space and right-of-ways is a big question that has to be determined in court. Um, so it's a, it's a big issue right now. This is uh, probably no historic value other than to us, but uh, <laughs> if you, uh, at this point, I mean, didn't, uh, you, in addition to the, your own uh, fruit and vegetables that you grew, that you bought, there was a time when you used to go down to Florida. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Oranges, and the funny story about you riding the back roads of Florida, being arrested, yeah, well, there's a song about uh, taking the back roads, back roads, so you won't, wouldn't get weighed. There's oh, a yeah, country yeah. and western song. And yeah. I, so in order to survive, we just couldn't survive on sheep and goats and goat milk and bees, and farming with horses. We couldn't pay the bills, and I'd I'd lost all that money, retirement money. I don't know what it was. It was a lot of money first year. So I said, I got to do something to bring in money. And we hadn't yet thought about farm markets. Oh, okay. That's, that's what that was about. So uh, I, I had a big truck. And I said, well, look, I, why not uh, bring something from this area down to Florida and bring stuff back? And I was in touch with all the co-ops. And what they needed was... Uh, tropical fruit that was organic that wasn't sprayed. The problem with Florida is that the quality of the fruit was not really good. That is because it was so wet, unlike the desert areas in California. There was lot, lots of fungus problems, lots of insect problems. So they insisted that the fruit be washed and colored artificially and then waxed. And up here with the different co-ops that exist, existed, they wanted organic fruit. So um, I brought down apple cider, dropped it off at several places on the way off. I had someone who I paid to come down so we'd be able to do this quickly. Uh, that is with a turnaround of four or five days. And we dropped off the cider, Tallahassee, Gainesville, uh, a number of places. And then we loaded it up from ci organic citrus from several farms. And then we went through the, uh, the back roads, the swamps, in, in between Florida and Georgia. And I remember going through at 2 o'clock in the morning through these swamp areas. And, um, and, but there were all kinds of laws about it. And in fact, it was the same route that drug smugglers were using to smuggle drugs into the country. And I noticed signs up saying when, when they were stopped by police. In this case, it's the Citrus Police. Citrus Commission. Florida Citrus Commission. Yeah. Come to, what, what did the knee of Brian say? Uh, yeah. Come to the Florida Sunshine State. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. So uh, they were artificially protecting the price of tomatoes, avocados, and citrus by limiting the quality and the amount of fruit coming out of uh, Florida, California, uh, and maybe New Mexico, I'm not sure, or Texas, mm -hmm. by having citrus commissions, armed citrus. So when they eventually found me, uh, uh, a number before, a number of them had been blown away by, by drug um, uh, smugglers uh, because if one of these citrus police came up and they were smuggling in millions of dollars worth of drugs. They would just blow them away with a shotgun, and that was it. Just throw them out to the alligators. And um, so when they finally surrounded our truck, it was about eight armed troopers with submachine guns, you know, AR-15 type guns. And they said, come out with your hands up. And uh, me and this other guy who was a Buddhist and a yogi came out, and they said, what you got? And I said, organic citrus. And they all said, oh. <laughs> and they locked us up. And, uh, and the judge the next morning said, uh, citrus smuggling, huh? And he said, you see, either contribute all the citrus, and we'll, we'll send it to some homeless shelters, or uh, the lowest fine I can give you is a buck a box. So we had to figure out some other way of getting it. We did. We figured out another way 
Uh, but it was lucrative. We earned about $1,000 a trip because all the citrus is pre-sold at all the uh, Fields of Plenty and Glud and uh, Stone Soup and all those places pre-ordered it. And uh, for a year, year and a half, it, it brought in enough money to get the farm started. Yeah. Smuggling organic citrus. I used to always say I was arrested by Anita Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The agent. So, uh, but it's quite an adventure, and it just took a while. And uh, yeah, that was an interesting episode. The, um, I guess we should move down to the current day. You said uh, talking about uh, you know how we ended up where we are, despite all this good activism. How did we end up with? Something. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, uh, despite most other people, I really look at Trump as a gift because uh, it's the result of the lack of organizing and attentiveness by liberals and others in the 70s, where there was that openness, uh, where the Council of Churches was the most popular Protestant group, Christian group in the countries, that was replaced by the fundamentalist groups that really had a plan, and the plan was to take over school boards all across the country and to uh, concentrate on state delegates to general assemblies and do actual organizing all across the country. Liberals and, and people on the left generally were not interested in local organizing. So we're down to, what, 15 Democratic governors? And... Uh, and part of it, I remember at the anniversary here at IPS, uh, when, I, when I suggested that we have a workshop on local organizing, there was a woman who lived in Montgomery County who said, uh, how outrageous. Why would you waste time getting local people elected? Why? And I, I said, lady, I said, you're not the only one who believes this way, but do you really think you have any impact on getting someone elected in Wisconsin? I mean. Yeah, you could write in and do some stuff, but really, you've got a Republican governor in Maryland. You've got some horrible people that represent you and, and act in the interest of Lockheed Martin rather than the citizenry. And in your area, um, uh, you've got farmers using chemicals, and that gets into your well. And why wouldn't you? She says, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. And that, that's pretty common up to even today. People... As of last week, people who love to complain about, uh, about Trump know nothing about who represents them in local government or care. And uh, it's been a problem. We did form a group, what, 12 years ago. 14 years ago, I started writing a column for a local newspaper in Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, and focusing on the need to look at the Democratic Party which was fairly ineffectual and ex extended that concept started by JFK of corporate liberalism and really was not paying attention to massive dissatisfaction all across the country uh, about uh, factories closing down, globalization. Uh, I mean, at the closest town to us near the farm, Hancock. Hancock used to be a booming city. Uh, but uh, because of globalization and the Walmart in Hagerstown, you know, it's, uh, people are either unemployed or working at the correctional institution in the Hagerstown. And uh, so we started focus, a little cadre of us started focusing on local elections. And we started by approaching John Cavana here, uh, David, David Korn, and others who lived in Montgomery County. Uh, we were trying to recruit to run, mm -hmm. and finally, I'd been I'd been uh, trying my best to make Jamie Raskin feel a little guilty about about being in Tacoma Park, and I I started putting pressure in writing in the columns about Jamie running. The son of Marcus. Yeah, son of Marcus Raskin, and and eventually he did agree. He he ran against an old line. Twelve years ago. Yeah, he ran against a uh, senator, which we thought. Maybe was a little too ambitious. Ida Rubin. She'd been there for 30 years. Uh, something like that, yeah. And he ran against, there was already a grassroots group because two years earlier, Linda Shade, a Green candidate, had gotten 10,000 votes in the 20th district. Now, there are a lot of districts when you get into a state. So you've got a congressional district. You've got 
uh, a school district, you've got county council districts, you've got at-large people on all of those levels, and, in, and for the Maryland Delegate Assembly, our district is divided down to three delegates and one state senator. And this is where the law happens, and this is an entrenched Democratic Party headed by entrenched people who are still who is still where essentially JFK was. They are still into corporate liberalism. And Bernie Sanders, you would think help from the Russians would have gotten them a few more votes, but, but opposition from the Democratic Party really killed his chances. Uh, but the fact that so many people, including so many young people, were, didn't care about the label socialism and uh, you know, like right now, I'm, one of the things I'm working on, uh, an alliance of progressives, is with DSA, mm -hmm. which I always thought of as a moderate group, and now it's one of the strongest left democratic groups, mm -hmm. uh, Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have been trying and succeeding at getting people elected to power locally. And so we vet we vet people, and uh, I mean, here's Kawizi and Fumi uh, from um, Baltimore that we back, Donna Edwards, Chris Van Hollen, um, you know, Jamie Raskin, and, and people, and all of a sudden people became aware of, uh, of people they should be voting for instead of mainstream Democratic people chosen by a Democratic party. And, you know, we identified our names, so they actually were um, uh, democratic neighbors and we we've sponsored seminars and workshops and uh, it's been mildly successful and now there's a record number of seats open mm -hmm. and so we uh, we're actually sponsoring in a few weeks uh, a Seder looking at the plagues and the question is how do people in Montgomery County in Maryland look at uh, what are what plagues are facing us, and in turn, who we should be supporting, and uh, and that's successful, and that goes on, and that's grown. So now, instead of one progressive group, pro progressive neighbors, there are about five or six, mm -hmm. including a Jewish group, Jews United for Justice, oh, yeah. that uh, that's doing good stuff. Yeah, They're all doing good stuff. In uh, so I I'd like to end with one thing. Um, because I, uh, <laughs> unless we have another meeting. Yeah, uh, I'd ask you also uh, I, yeah. what, you know, what are you most proud of that you've done in the years? Well, it, it, really, it really does come down to, um, uh, to me, uh, to legacy. I, I do want to, after all, I'm 75 right now, and I, we, I have three children, and I want them to be proud of a father who's dedicated his life to social justice, a and I want them to stay involved in social justice, not to feel that, um, uh, you know, like right now there are six projects I'm involved in before the farm season begins. Off. Well, I'm trying, yeah, uh, and, but, you know, because I, I try to go to sleep early, because I get up at five o'clock every morning, I work out to keep myself healthy, the local YMCA is where I work out, which is an incredible institution. Uh, but I have here a picture of my son before he left Montgomery Blair getting a, joining a protest against the World Bank mm -hmm. and getting him and his older brother arrested in those protests mm -hmm. against the World Bank. So I'm, I'm hoping that my kids, rather than drift into the world of capitalism and consumerism, that, uh, that they remain fighting the fight. And I think there's always opportunity. I think as long as you put time into, uh, uh, and I, I, we don't seem to have it in us to buy new cars, uh, to go on location, va vacations, which will involve going on cruises. And I mean, to take a day or two off is okay. Our last big vacation was going to Tanzania where we volunteered at Catholic Relief um, uh, in, in small villages in the area of agriculture and organic farming and trying to fight the infringement of GMOs and chemical farming into rural areas in 